Oh, hi. I've been digging uh, deep into the history of rail transport in Great Britain to help me plan my end scale layout, which is supposedly going over there. But since I've only got a really tiny piece of space to work with over there, track planning is going to be essential. To go from this 5x2 blank slate to this thriving country town. G'day, I'm Stephen Spry and greetings from down under. Now pen and paper are basically fine for track planning and noting down ideas, but come on, it is the 21st century people, so you've really got to be using some track planning software. So today I'm demonstrating how and why I'm using Rail Model Pro for Mac with its layers function to design my layout, which will eventually be built with Pico Streamline Track and Manual Points, DC Twin Cab Control over 17 sections and buildings from scalescenes.com. For me, planning is extremely important as I just don't have the wiggle room with 5 foot by 2 foot or 1580 by 60 millimetres in metric to correct silly blunders. <laughs> Nor the dollars either for that matter. Look, my wants are simple. I want continuous running and some switching. Along with reversing loops to turn the trains to run in the opposite directions both ways. Hmm, but, wow, well, well, that looks a little, uh, strange like that, but oh, it does get better, trust me. <laughs> and it's also got to be very light, as it's in a mobile home. And I also like to have a backstory which explains how and why things are as they are at the location model, just as you might do when prototyping. So I'm going to base my fictional countryside partly on the Rothbury area in Northumberland in Northern England, which I first discovered back in the early 1980s, when the well-known Ian Fooders model stations from the Northumberland Central Railway. And there are also plenty of pictures online so that you can see what the countryside is actually like. So let's get started. A long, long time ago, on the other side of the planet, somewhere in northern England, the hidden gem known as Narrowlock Valley was... What, what's going on? Not so dramatic. Okay. This is the backstory of the fictional NVCC and RR. Many hundreds of years ago in northern England, a hidden gem now known as Narrowlock Valley was discovered. Slowly, people made their way to the area crossing the stream using a ford. And over time, proper walking and cart tracks were formed across the valley. And some loved what they saw so much they settled here, farming the land and added stepping stones across the ford to make travel a little easier. Ever so slowly, the population grew until a small village with several small houses and a tavern, uh, um, a shop, was built on the flood-free land near the stream. Some enterprising locals even forged a track to the top of Big Rock to take advantage of the tremendous views of the area. Increased prosperity meant a small bridge was able to be built to replace the ford, which sometimes caused major inconvenience when it flooded. Of course, it didn't take long for the church to decide there was need for religion in this uncivilised place. So they built a church. And a school for the children. Sometime around the early 1700s, the Industrial Revolution started to take off, and canal networks began to spread across the country. You see, one horse-drawn canal barge could carry about 30 tonnes of freight at a time, faster than the horse and cart road transport, and at half the cost. And yes, technically canals did not make it to this part of Northumberland, but we did say it was fictional, 
and I do want to include canal and narrowboats on the layout. In the late 1780s, a new company surveyed the Narrowlock Valley and decided to canalise the stream. This would provide a vital transport freight shortcut between two competing canal networks. The development was completed quickly with a range of bank improvements to provide more level land for future building, some beautification from the row of trees, a lock keeper's cottage of course, and a new warehouse, all paid for by the newly formed Narrowlock Valley Canal Company. And the first narrowboats appeared on the newly opened Narrowlock Valley Canal less than a year later. They didn't know it at the time, but the commercial usefulness of the canal was to be relatively short-lived. Over the next few decades, the prosperity from the canal traffic attracted many new residents. More homes and shops were built in the area. The main road through the valley was sealed between the church and the school. However, by the 1840s, the development of railways began to threaten canals, and most of the investment that had previously gone into canal building was diverted into railway building. The very clever Narrowlock Valley Canal Company decided to build their own railroad through the area forming the Narrowlock Valley Canal Company and Railroad, or the NVCC and RR. And by 1850, the NVCC and RR had built a main line through the valley. They had also built a freight yard, a station, several other station buildings including a signal box and a goods shed and a fleet of carriages. All the additional work generated by the railroad meant that the roads needed to be improved yet again. Things were indeed prosperous and the NVCC and RR also built a grand water tower on Big Rock although the eccentric company owner really wanted to build his own folly, which wouldn't look much out of place on the layout somewhere. And things kept improving at such an amazing rate that the NVCC and RR built a new branch line to the higher parts of the valley, with additional passenger and freight facilities. As you can see, the upper track now forms a reversing loop in green, which allows trains to change direction and run back down to the lower level, anti-clockwise. However, we still need another reversing section down below to allow them to return to a clockwise direction of travel. Now, both of those green sections will have reversed polarity issues so you'll need to take measures to fix that. The population continued to expand, so new terraced houses and shops were built. The small goods shed in the yard was replaced with a much larger freight centre. A new lookout was built at Big Rock for tourism, and the main roads throughout the area were improved once again along with better tarmac near the new freight centre and also at the passenger station and included a war memorial fountain. The early 1920s however saw the demise of the canals for freight and the old canal warehouse was closed. In the mid 20s it was replaced by a garage to service all the new road traffic that was now coming to the area. The tavern also took the opportunity to buy some old adjacent properties for future expansion 
initially using it to provide parking for all these newfangled vehicles. And even more houses and buildings were constructed as the area grew and grew and grew. Let's take a moment and look at all the vehicles that are needed to add character to a layout. Let's have a look over at the church. What's going on there? Uh, is it a wedding or a funeral? I'm not quite sure. See all the people heading off to school. <laughs> Someone's going to be late. And all the vehicles now using the pub and the garage. And don't forget the commuter traffic and all the other general traffic and of course all the freight vehicles now on the road. The increasing competition from road transport during the 1920s and 30s greatly reduced the revenue available to the railways until the 1960s and there had been such a slow long decline in the usage of rail for both passenger and freight services. So much so that many lines across England were closed or amalgamated. Somehow our NVCC and RR survived nationalisation in the late 1940s and the beaching cuts in the 1960s and continued to operate as a private railroad. But rail patronage continued to decline across the country. Passenger services on the NVCC and RR were eventually stopped and while the sidings were still used for freight, the station building fell into disrepair. Luckily for the NVCC and RR, they excelled at running their freight operations, which now included rail and road. So that still remained profitable, for them at least. But by the late 1970s, the locals were still demanding a commuter service and eventually the NVCC and RR built a smaller, cheaper station nearby and ran short DMUs to provide a small regular commuter passenger service. Years later in the noughties a clever local group of enthusiasts restored a steam loco and several historical carriages originally used on the NVCC and RR. They now operate a heritage railway line and museum from the original station building. And that's the history of the NVCC and RR up to today. Finally, since no layout is ever final, and this one has an opportunity to be expanded to another smaller shelf layout at 90 degrees to the southeast corner, with a single track connection to that being shown here, and of course, being more modern era now, upgraded roads again, and a possible new road tunnel to connect to the new section. Now, Rail Modeler Pro has a 3D view which sadly at this stage only shows the tracks. So I cheated somewhat and added another layer of different coloured track to represent the roads and the stream. And then you can slowly reveal all the other different layers showing the different sections of track until you get the bottom layer complete. And at this point we'll add the first part of the top layer and then the return loop. And you've got the final layout. You can wiggle around as much as you like now to see how things look. Now, as far as costs are concerned, how much do you think this might cost? <laughs> well, be prepared to be surprised. In this 5x2 space, there's only around $400 worth of Pico Streamline track 
20 metres in total, with 12 turnouts. All points will be manually switched, as I really can't afford another $240 or more for electric operation. And with such a small layout, I also can't see any point in the expense of using DCC at $300 plus for such a small space. So this will be a DC only layout. That also helps slightly reduce the cost of any locos I might want as well. The layout design is split into sections, eight on the bottom with one reverse loop in green and seven on the top with another reverse loop also in green. For simple DC cat control of up to two locos. So that means I'll need 17 double pole double throw switches at around about $3 to wire that up. And speaking of locos, it is a branch line with very tight curves. So only 060s or 044s at around about, let's say, $200 each. And short carriages can run on it. But that was mostly typical of the era in rural England anyway, so no big boys here or super fast intercity trains. And I'll also need two passenger carriages at around about $90 and a dozen or so freight wagons at $10 to $15 each, so that's about $250 for them. Sheesh. I think those DMUs are going to have to wait till much later. <laughs> Ah uh, well, the buildings, they come from scalescenes.com and are around 10 to $15 each to be printed and glued onto card and there are around 15 or so that I want so I'll have to allow another $200 for that. And then don't forget the hardware and the craft supplies etc that are also needed to do all the landscaping and trees. And all of that adds up to well over a grand for something pretty basic in a 5x2 shelf. Oh well, I never said the hobby was cheap to get involved in, but I have saved a fair bit by using DC and card buildings versus plastic kits. I hope you can see why I need to get the planning done right, otherwise I could quite easily be wasting lots of dollars buying stuff that is not going to work in the space available. And in reality, the narrow lock valley layout still has to be built. Oh well, <laughs> wish me luck. Cheers for now.